From Cary Leveneers, it's Simply Science. Rain in the forecast. Now, here's Ken Barlow and Belinda Jensen. Hello and welcome to Simply Science. I'm Belinda Jensen. And I'm Ken Barlow. We're here in Hugo, just south of Forest Lake, on the dairy farm of Fran and Marianne Miron. We're watching the weather. And the weather forecasts. Is a way of life. You know, we all keep an eye on the weather, but for farmers like the Mirons, they pay special attention because their livelihood depends on the rain, especially if they grow hay for their livestock. For this edition of Simply Science, the Mirons have kindly allowed our cameras on their farm, starting in early spring, to see what's happened. We'll look at the growing season this year and see how it's been, and we'll also see how Ken and I have been doing in predicting rain in the forecast. In late April, sounds of spring fill the air. On the Miron farm, that means planting corn and cutting hay. When rain falls, it nourishes the plants. But what happens to the water that runs off? We travel down Dinosaur Ridge, past the Devil's Drop-Off, to the Minnesota River bottom to find out. Midsummer rains kept the pond in front of the Miron farm full of frogs. We'll go eyeball to eyeball with a friendly amphibian who needs a thousand human friends. This one's the biggest. Finally, how does the Miron garden grow? With heavy bales and cucumber tails and pretty beans all in a row. Hey, Belle, did you know that uh, farmers have to make hay while the sun shines? Yeah, I've heard that before. I think there's a lot more to that saying. Yeah, as a matter of fact, Fran and his sons can't even make hay if there's rain in the forecast. Sounds like we better get the forecast right. That's for sure. And timing, as we'll see, is everything. Each spring, when the pond fills with water from melted snow, life abounds. And the sounds of tractors fill the air, too. The farm has been in the family for almost 112 years and uh, has been farmed continuously during that period of time. We've always had uh, dairy cows and have raised crops on, on the farm. Every morning and evening, 365 days a year, the Miron family milks the cows, all 60 of them. I like its color and I like its number. The Miron farm sits on 500 acres an area the size of 400 football fields, with rolling hills and creeks and marshes too. Oftentimes, uh, farmers view the low, wet, marshy areas as wasteland, and yet uh, I think it's long been recognized by my family that this land can be very productive and useful at times when, when we need it. And we need to protect it and preserve it and, and maintain it. Protect the land from what? Both too much rain and too much sun. So as much as possible, farmers keep it covered. On the Miron farm, that means alfalfa fields for hay and grass for pasture. They're in, uh, you know, real good cover for, for most of the time, which protects the soil from washing and, uh, and also provides uh, a nice filter for, for any, any rain and, and runoff. Farmers talk about rain more than meteorologists. So it would be nice to see some additional rain, and, and they're talking rain in the forecast tonight. Like the rest of us, farmers want just the right amount for their crops and animals. Not too much, not too little. But what makes it rain in the first place? Here's Mr. Science with the answer. It's all part of a process in the atmosphere scientists call the water cycle. Water molecules at the surface of everything wet are constantly jumping, bouncing into the air. This is called evaporation, the first step in the water cycle. As these molecules rise, they cool and attach themselves to small particles in the air and become water droplets again. Scientists call this condensation. You get enough water droplets, you get a cloud. Clouds can travel long distances before the water droplets get big enough to fall out of the sky. That's called precipitation rain or snow. The water soaks into the ground or runs downhill to form streams, lakes, and rivers that return to the ocean and join the water cycle again. No rain, you check the gauge and everything. And the Twin Cities area had about four and a half inches of rain in May, an inch above normal. During the wettest May ever in 1906, over 10 inches fell. The driest May 1934 saw less than a quarter of an inch. Most years, we average about 30 inches of precipitation, rain and snow. But one July day in 1972, Parker Township near Alexandria got 14 inches. 
by the middle of May, it's time to plant. Corn to feed the livestock. Bag has about 80,000 kernels in it. And peas for the Miron family's vegetable garden. We're gonna need some more water, yeah. Two of the boys, Mark and Paul, are working in the hay fields. A hay crop will mature in about four to six weeks, and we try to harvest at a, at a stage of maturity where it has the highest protein levels so that it, it becomes a quality feed for the dairy cows. And that doesn't always happen because weather may prohibit that from, from happening. But we cut the hay, and it takes several days to, to dry down and cure. And when it's uh, near dry, what would be around 12-13% uh, moisture, we'll rake the hay. We actually flip it over and, and combine the windrows so that they're large enough so that the, the baler can handle that capacity. The boys are all involved in that. Uh, Mark uh, has been cutting most of the hay this year. He, he runs the, the tractor with the mower. You need to continue that process because we've got so many acres to cover. So um, I, I may be uh, baling hay and Mark may be cutting hay and Paul may be raking hay all at the same time. We've got a hay storage up above and then down below the cattle state. In June, the Mirons celebrate Dairy Month, giving tours of their operation to school groups. There's about 3,500 bales of hay in the barn already. And each one of those bales weighs about 50 pounds. And that's what we feed the cows in the wintertime. Now most city folks haven't been in a dairy barn. It'll splash on you. Stand way back. Stand way back. But it's an important part of the story. When Simply Science returns, we'll learn how Fran cleans up after his cows to help protect the environment. There. Welcome back to Simply Science. When rain falls on the Miron farm and everywhere else, some of it soaks into the ground where the corn and the hay use it to grow. Rain that doesn't soak into the ground makes its way across the land to the nearest creek, river, or lake. As we see in our next story, the Mirons and everyone else have waterfront property. A watershed is an area of land that drains into a river. Anywhere that you are at any time on the surface of the earth, you're in a watershed. And if it rains on top of you and where you are, that water is going to flow across the land and empty into a river or a lake uh, and eventually, in most cases, find its way to an ocean. Rivers of Life is an internet program developed by Hamlin University in St. Paul for schools all over the world. It helps students learn more about watersheds. What we're looking at on this map is uh, an illustration of the Mississippi River watershed. Within Minnesota we have the Minnesota River and it of course has its own watershed within the Mississippi River system. The Rivers of Life program connects 350 schools around the world. Hilltop Elementary in Henderson in, in the Minnesota River watershed is one of them. Show us where you think the dead zone is. Right around this area right here where it drains are you saying that it's possible for something poisonous or some pollutant to go from Lesur and Henderson down the Minnesota, down the Mississippi, and be in yeah. the water here? Mm -hmm. All the way through the ocean. Okay, could be all the way through the ocean. Everybody gather here quick. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Let's pretend you put some awful stuff on the ground right here. Okay, now the rain came along today and we had two tenths of an inch, yeah. but what if we had two inches? It's going to go into this ravine at the top of the watershed. The water from here goes through the devil's drop off, but you know where it's going to end up. Eventually, the stuff from here is going to end up in the Minnesota River. What's the big word for that? This erosion. It used to be farm field. When I was a bit younger, there were two roads that came down through the ravine two farm roads, one on either side. Both have been totally washed away. Cars, wagons, even a truck would pass under here and go along the uh, railroad track. There's only two feet of uh, clearance now. This is all coming off of that top where we stopped and showed the kids if you put certain things here, it'll end up down here. Well, this is the down here. Since 1993, both the river and the river valley and ravines 
really have taken a battering. A year ago in the summer, about this time, we had a five incher, five inches of rain, struck Henderson in this area. That takes a big gouge out when, when that kind of thing happens. Grass waterways, uh, contour strip cropping, uh, terraces, uh, conservation practices are used to protect the soil from eroding, which, which eventually impacts our, our streams and our water sources. The Miron Farm sits on one of the highest hills in Washington County. It's right at the headwaters, the beginning, of Hardwood Creek, a tributary of Rice Creek in the Rice Creek watershed. All of our uh, farm fields, uh, you know, drain or empty into uh, eventually into Hardwood Creek and, uh, and then flow downstream into, into Peltier Lake or the Rice Creek uh, chain of lakes, which uh, actually serves as a backup water supply for the city of St. Paul. You know, the farmers and people of this area take a particular interest and concern uh, the quality of, of the water that's entering the, the Rice Creek chain of lakes. The Mirons are doing their part to keep from polluting Hardwood Creek. Last year, with help from government agencies, they built a cement lagoon to hold manure from their dairy cows. You see how high that culvert is? Yeah. Okay. Water is flowing from the other side of the road and flows into this pond, which is lower. When the pond fills up and overflows, water runs to this culvert, or pipe. So what we do is we like to keep grass cover here, and, and the water flows into the pipe so we don't lose any soil, and, and nothing washes away. Let's go down and look at the other end where the pipe comes out at, okay? Right here, and it makes the stream yep. going through the, the, the pipe. The pipe comes right here. And then the water flows through this ditch, and this ditch is, is dug so everything drains that way. And it goes all the way through the field and down along the field, all the way to the creek. Almost all of us live upstream of somebody, and so we're responsible for making sure that the water that flows past us is as good as it can be for our neighbors who live downstream. I happen to live in the city of St. Paul. What I think of sometimes is a storm sewer watershed. When it rains on my house and in my yard, it flows right across the pavement, right down into the gutter, into the storm sewer, and very quickly finds its way to the river. Chemical spills on the ground. We, you know, we spill gasoline on our driveway, fertilizer on the streets, and then it rains, and that water flows uh, across the surface, carrying those materials and emptying them into a river or a lake. Whatever I'm putting into the Mississippi here in St. Paul, that same water is going to be drinking water for 14 million people downstream, including the whole city of New Orleans. So no matter where you live in the Twin Cities, essentially we all have riverfront property. When we come back, Simply Science finds out that the pond on the Miron farmstead holds more than the stormwater runoff from the hills above the farm. You know, here on the Miron farm, you can see a lot more than dairy cows. In front of the farmhouse, there's a pond, and this year there are plenty of frogs. You know, scientists call amphibians like frogs and toads and salamanders indicator species. The presence or absence of them really tells a lot about how clean the water is. Here's Sam, right there. Sam, right there. Amphibians first crawled out of the oceans 350 million years ago, a hundred million years before the dinosaurs. Today there are almost 3,000 species. 14 are found right here in Minnesota. As we were growing up as kids, we used to catch frogs for the, for the uh, bait shops. That was the money we made through the summertime. We actually had a real good uh, collie German Shepherd dog that uh, crossed that used to catch frogs with us. You know, you'd be out looking for frogs and, and one would jump in the grass and the dog would just kind of, with both paws together, jump forward and he'd hold that frog until you came to, to get it from him. We used to have orders for, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 dozen of frog on a, on a particular day, even in hay fields where we were bailing and we'd, you know, bring a, a, a gunny sack along, keep it wet and moist and, and, uh, and catch frogs during the day while we were bailing. Used to see, you know, um, hundreds and hundreds of frogs, and, and then we went through a real spell where we didn't see too many. And I think some of the bait shops actually went away from frogs then um, too. 
Adult frogs look a lot different than the tiny fish-like creatures they start out looking like in the beginning of their life cycle. Tadpoles, or polywogs as they're called, still need clean water. It doesn't matter where you find them. Let me see. Yeah, I caught one. Amphibians are animals that spend part of their life cycle in water. Here on the shores of Lake Superior, forests provide habitat for adult frogs and toads, and rock formations provide pools of warm water for the start of their life cycle. These are tiny gray tree frog polywogs, newly hatched from eggs laid in the water. They're eating algae to grow. Oh, we have an almost completely full grown one right there. Do you see him? Is that in the bright green one? It's easier, you kind of get in along the vegetation. And then there we go, there's, we got a polywog. And it's starting to get his back feet. See yeah. you know what kind that is? Oh, yeah. This is probably a um, tree frog. The class that's here today is actually a group of teachers from uh, Frog Institute at Hamlin University. Did he say Frog Institute? And it's a, a summer course offered to teachers to help them learn how to teach frog conservation and biology to their students. This is a big one. This is a big fat polylog thingy with a little bit of back legs. Oh. See right there it is. It, there's both. Yeah, it's, it's, oh, there yeah, both it is. Of them. Yep. But this once numerous ancient family of animals is in trouble. A lot of times people ask me what is the cause for the decline in amphibians and I kind of facetiously give them a simple answer, it's humans. People should be concerned about the declining amphibians because they are an indicator for other things that are going on in the environment. The effect of habitat loss, fragmentation of the remaining habitat, we're looking at evaluation of chemical contamination of those habitats, and that can come from a wide variety of things, air pollution, deposition, transportation of chemicals over continents, many hundreds and thousands of miles away from the source, agricultural chemicals, urban runoff from sewage treatment plants, possibility of parasites and other diseases, looking at the effects of UV radiation, and the thinning of the ozone layer. It's a very complex issue and there's people working on all, all facets of it. Scientists and teachers aren't the only people investigating. Student scientists, especially since young people discovered deformed frogs in Henderson in 1995, are learning why amphibians are in trouble too. Well, let's see, what were you testing for, pH? At the Tri-District School in Roseville, students study the simple chemistry of water pollution. They are part of the 1,000 Friends of Frogs program sponsored by the Center for Global Environmental Education at Hamlin University. Tonight is Frog Night. It's a chance for them to take what they've learned in the classroom and come out into, the, into our wetlands that we have here at school, which we're really lucky to have, and uh, hopefully catch some frogs and toads. She got Another thing we're doing tonight is collecting some water samples to check for water quality, checking for nitrates, ammonia, pH. What are the safe levels, do you remember? Six, seven, eight. One of the things that we emphasize is just uh, being respectful of the environment and not just tromping through it. The habitats that we have right here in the city are as important as any other. We got the mama toad now. Lawnmowers are major predators, and not a natural predator, but a major predator on on amphibians, especially in the city's toads when they first emerge in large numbers. Or if you have a house that is right near a wetland, if everybody around that wetland mows right up to the edge of that wetland, you also are going to lose your frogs. So let it go natural. That gives the frogs and other wildlife a good place to live. So the more natural you can make your land, the better. Whether or not you're going to get frogs, we won't know till you try. Stay tuned, when Simply Science returns, we'll see who's helping stack the hay on the Miron Farm. You know, Belinda, I remember my first weather forecast. I actually was about 10 years old and did better than the guy on TV did. When you were forecasting the rain? I was rain. forecasting the rain, yeah. You know, I first started out in Salt Lake City, Utah, and in Utah they grow a lot of hay. In fact, they cut hay numerous times throughout the summer, and they need three solid dry days. And so I would get calls from very you know, anxious farmers wondering, OK, are you sure it's not going to rain? And in Salt Lake City, 20% chance of thunderstorms is pretty much every single day. Exactly. And so. you know, measuring the rain is the easy part of the weather business. It's trying to predict how much will fall into this thing, where it gets complicated. 
When you come out to a field, you kind of feel the hay, and if you kind of feel it, you can tell that it's dry now and it's ready to bale, so. You don't want all the moisture out, but most of it. Because if you put it in the barn and it's wet, then it'll heat when you stack it on top of each other. So. There are days where we'll rake it and bale it all on the same day, depending on what the weather's like. Every summer, the Mirons plant, cut, rake, bale, and stack 35,000 bales of hay to feed their dairy cows during the winter months. Most years, they grow three or four crops. That requires a constant eye on the weather. We listen to the weather constantly on the radio. Uh, we catch the broadcasts on TV uh, and sometimes even listen to several. I remember listening to uh, one of the, the long range uh, forecasts saying that June was going to be a wetter than normal month. And, and so we cut and we really made hay, if you will, <laughs> during that time when we could. Just over six inches of rain fell on the Mirons hay fields during June. That's almost two inches above normal for our area. We need about, uh, oh, three days without rain to be able to cure hay. And I remember those two weeks because it was, uh, it was very, very difficult to, to, uh, to make hay. Yeah. July was a much drier month on the Miron farm. Less than two inches of rain fell, most of it on one day, the 14th. <laughs> We try to look at, uh, you know, different forecasters and what their predictions are and use some of our own intuition, if you will, or, or guesstimates as to what's going to happen. But, you know, predicting weather for a large area and the, the things that occur in the upper atmosphere don't always affect each acre of land the, the same and, and, or each community the same. Professional meteorologists as a group get tomorrow's forecast right about 85% of the time. But predicting what the weather will be like beyond five days from now is about like flipping a coin. They're talking rain here this week soon, so I'll probably just let it go. And if we don't get any rain, then I'll have to turn the sprinkler on. But I haven't had to water it with the sprinkler yet this year. I've just been letting the rainfall do it, so. Get the camera out more often to get grandpa to work. <laughs> Harvest before constrictions appear between seeds, and seeds are about half grown. Pods should be wiped oh, clean but not clean. washed. Leaf stems attached. What about that one? At the end of the summer, with the corn ready for picking and the hay barn almost full, Marianne Miron takes Michael and Andrew to show the fruits of their labor at the Washington County Fair. I added some beans and cucumbers, um, beets, cabbage, broccoli, eggplant, carrots. I think I got mostly first and second place ribbons on most of my things. Some of the things didn't place, but that's how it goes sometimes. But I'm happy with what did place, and I'm glad that I brought my stuff. That's good. A lot of work goes into making the food that people eat, you know, and, and it doesn't just come from the grocery store. Well, Ken, the Mirans have had a great harvest of corn this year. Yeah, I'd say so, and I can't wait to sample an ear or two. We'll have to say congratulations to Michael and the rest of the Miron family for all the ribbons they won at the county fair. And thanks to Fran, Marianne, and their children. Michael, Mark, Paul, Anne, Katie, and Andrew for opening up their farm to all of us and for all their help. We hope you've enjoyed meeting them as much as we have and learning about how important it is to them and the frogs in their pond when Ken and I say rain in the forecast. I'm Belinda Jensen. And I'm Ken Barlow. Thanks for joining us.